FBC, we're so glad that you've decided to join us to start off this new year in worship. We pray that 2021 will be a year that brings you closer to our Lord so that we can all reach and transform others through Jesus Christ. A couple of announcements this morning. First of all, our worship services will remain online only until further notice. You can join us virtually at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings, or you can access any worship services on Facebook or YouTube at any time that you would like. Our annual meeting that was due to play, take place in December will be held at a future date to be announced. When we can return to in-person worship, we will announce the new date two to three weeks in advance so that you are aware. Until then, we'll be following the budget as set in 2020. As we walk into a new year together and a new sermon series on hope and revive in this new life, let's consider these words from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. Is that 
blessed new year to you. Are you not thankful that God has finally brought to an end 2020? How many of you Thursday night said, thank you God for bringing 2020 to an end? With this COVID-19 mess, the chaos of political situation, the spread of the sickness, uh, the restrictions we're having to impose to shut down worship, family get-togethers and vacations, this has been one difficult year. And many of us are looking forward to a far better 2021 with the hope of vaccinations. We are looking to the future with some optimism that the end of this is all in sight. This frustration that our country and the world has gone through has created current cultural situations that have created a lot of stress among people that impact our relationships between coworkers, friends, and even family. The increased stress has impacted us to the point that our emotions are soaring, angle levels are up, depression is dropping it to its lowest, that one can go into the midst of the darkness and everyone seems ready to beat everyone else up. Conflict is on the rise everywhere we look. Emotions are frayed and it seems like we have walked into the wilderness without little hope of getting out. But here's the thing. Most of us think that wandering in the wilderness as a circumstance of frustration or maybe even a punishment that God gives to us or maybe it's a place of banishment. And after all, we, when we think of the wilderness biblically, we often think of it as God's punishment to Israel for not following God's direction to enter into the promised land. When we talk about the wilderness in our life, we often talk about being lost, wandering aimlessly, uh, walking with a sense of absence from God. But what if the purpose of the wilderness experience for the Israelites and even ourselves is something very different? very different. Over and over again, God has Israel going through wilderness experiences, and they're not so much for punishment as they are to help the people of Israel be drawn into God and a closer relationship with God because it wasn't close enough. For example, with the first one, when we referred to Moses' experience of the people not wanting to go into the promised land, it was a time for 40 years of training training and, and circumstances that would draw them closer and closer to one another and to God. There was another wilderness experience that happened in 722 BC with the northern kingdom of Israel when it was conquered uh, by the Assyrians and the Assyrians carried most of the Israelites off and put them into slavery and it was a time for them also to have a re newing of experience where they could encounter the closeness of God. And then again in 586 BC, the southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar, and they are carried off to a wilderness captivity. And these wilderness experiences came because the people have wandered away from God, but they were not there as a punishment. They were there as a process to draw the people closer and closer to God. But for many of these people in these three major times of Israelite history where they were wandering in the wilderness, many of them were wondering, why God? Many of the people were wondering, where is God? And they also were thinking too, often like you and I do, why does God seem so far away? And I'm sure many of them were saying, when will this end, God? Do those questions sound familiar to you? We as human beings in life have had wilderness experiences. We lose a job. We have relationships that have become broken. We have a poor health experience. Or we have a series of setbacks after setbacks after setbacks. And when we encounter those wilderness experiences, it often feels like we are being punished. Or maybe we're receiving the judgment of God for something. Or... If we don't have much faith or God orientation, maybe say it's just a stroke of bad luck, bad karma, bad circumstances that we've got to walk through. And when those moments happen, yes, we feel alone. We feel isolated. We feel 
the loss. And worse, we may feel abandoned and like we're just trying to survive and we cry out, why God, where is God? But what if these wilderness experiences have a different purpose than what our mind thinks? What if these wilderness experiences are not a time of God's abandonment, but a time when God is actually closer in our lives than we can see? What if these wilderness experiences are a door for us to walk through to encounter even a more closer relationship with God? What if it is a door we are to walk through to strengthen our faith, to build our character, and develop us so that we too can become a giant conqueror like David, or we too might become a victor over the darkness of the evil one like the apostles, or we too might enjoy the experience of being a resurrected person that overcomes the death of sin in our lives so that we might have the power of God, so we might have a deeper presence of God with a deeper understanding of God's grace and love that impacts ourselves, our loved ones, and our co-workers through the kingdom of God. God through us. What if these wilderness experiences in our lives are about us walking through the door of hope that strengthens us to be better for our own sake, for the sake of the people around us, and yes, ultimately for the glory of God? Have you ever been on a hike or a walk in nature and come across a field of wildflowers? No one plants them. No one waters them. And most often you see them growing even in weed patches. But they bloom in adversity. There's no one at Home Depot watering them or at Lowe's weeding them or the nursery which has them in the greenhouse to help them grow. No, they're in the hardest places sometimes, blooming and growing right where they're planted, in the wilderness. And they are designed to bloom in adversity. And I'm wondering if maybe you and I are also called to bloom in adversity. You see, you and I are God-built people. And when we are God-built people, we are not people who are to depend on our own strength, but God's strength. But you and I are designed to bloom in our adversity, no matter what is happening in our lives, no matter how dark it may seem, no matter what may be going on, God is using that brokenness within us to build our need for God. You see, we don't have to stay broken, but God takes that and God says, yes, you are broken. Yes, you are in the wilderness, but the wilderness is not to punish you. It is a place where you can learn about God, grow in God, and become more dependent of it upon God. But if we don't recognize that the wilderness can become an equal opportunity destroyer, it is a place where eventually, sooner or later, you and I and every human being are going to walk through. And everyone has wilderness experiences life. And pain is an equal opportunity destroyer. It will come and it will destroy. But what if the wilderness is not a place where we are destroyed, but it is a place where God is to grow us. Maybe it is a place where we are to focus our thoughts, our experiences, our beings upon God and see what God might do. The prophet Hosea says in Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, therefore, I am now going to lure her, really uh, reflecting to Israel at that point. That is who he, her is. And bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. From there, I will give her her vineyards and make the Valley of Achor, which literally means the Valley of Trouble, a door of hope. You see, our wilderness experiences are literally to lead us through the valley of trouble, through the door of hope, so that we might grow more in God and become stronger children 
of God. You see, God utilizes the wilderness to reveal our need for God. And God's a, and God uses the wilderness to heal us of our spiritual and our emotional needs in God and learn how to do the will of God. It is not a punishment. The wilderness is a test to our hearts. It is a development process for us so we can create character. That is where we learn empathy for people is when we walk through the wilderness. That is when we learn compassion for people, when we walk through the wilderness. How do you get hope in the wilderness? You see, some of us think if I could just have a pedicure or a manicure, I will feel so good. And all the while, what we really need is not one of those, but a God-sized cure, a cure that only God can bring. And that is what the wilderness is about. We are thinking if we just get this done to our body, if we just have this vacation, we will have a cure and enjoy uh, a hope that will bring us through this hopeless situation. No, 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 no. We don't need a vacation and we don't need a manicure or a pedicure. We need a God-sized cure. And that can only happen with a live encounter with Jesus. And most often those live encounters with Jesus in the walk of the Christian happen when we depend upon God. And when we go in the wilderness, God can develop us. Why do you think in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the one of the first things that Jesus does is go into the wilderness for 40 days? He does so before he's even called out into ministry. It is a place where he learns to grow and depend more and more in his relationship with God. And by the way, it is not a mistake that after all three of those gospels list that wilderness experience, that the first thing that happens to Jesus is the temptation of the devil in his life. You see, God uses the wilderness even in Jesus' life to grow him closer to God, to depend more upon God, so he would be prepared to reflect God even in temptation. You see, God loves his own son so dearly, he sends him to the wilderness to allow him to have more time to grow and become more dependent in his relationship with God. And you know what? God lovingly arranges the wilderness experiences within our own lives so we can lean in on Jesus, so we can learn from Jesus, so that we can grow in Jesus, so that we can come to a place where God can not only bring us out of the wilderness, but God can take us into a door of hope and lead us through where God can get the glory, not just in me, but what God does, so that I know that God is acting, and it's not what I have done. But it is what God has done. And here's the thing. You and I have got to walk through the wilderness and walk through the door of hope through Jesus Christ so that we can grow in these experiences. It is not a mistake that Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 say, we have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever basically in us you see when he died and rose again he tore the court curtain of the holies of holies apart so that he could blow his spirit into our holy of holies of our spirit in our soul so that he could be present and be the high priest there forever who leads us on you see we have an unshakable hope in jesus R.C. Sproul has said it this way, hope has been called the anchor of the soul because it gives stability to the Christian life. Hope is just not a wish. When we have wish lists, that's not hope. That is when we become hopeless, when we start seeking out the, the, the fulfillment of our wish list. We're not seeking out God himself in our lives, but we're seeking out our wishes for 
Our hope is found in God. It is not found in the Santa Claus God, for God is not a 911 bellhop. God is not a genie in our lamp that you rub so that poof, he might come up and grant us our wishes. God's not like that at all. God is the hope in our souls. And the only way we can get hope for our souls is to hide in the presence of God. And we are called to hide in God. You see, hope latches onto the certainty of the promises of God and the promises of God's eternity and the understanding of God's character. You see, those who follow Jesus, those of us who have seen God work dynamically in our lives, often can become hopeless because we lose sight of that. And we're waiting for this certain thing to happen. And we're not looking for God. We're looking for this thing to happen. And when it doesn't happen, we often feel attacked by God. We're saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Why didn't this happen? But maybe, just maybe, God is working on something that we can't see yet. And that is why we need to get up and walk through this door of hope. You see, the Hebrew word for hope comes from the root word that literally means to wait, to look. Well, what are we waiting upon? What are we looking for? Well, Isaiah 40 tells us what that is. And we are called to wait upon the Lord. Isaiah would write in verse 28 of chapter 40 and following these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary. God's understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even young people will faint and be weary, and the young will fill a fall exhausted, but those who wait, and that Hebrew word wait there literally means hope, love, look for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now that is hope that is walking through the door of hope. We wait on God, we put our hope on God. When we look for God, when we put our hope in God, we put it where it belongs, in God. And that is when the real things of God can happen in our lives, even in the hardest of circumstances. And that is when we can see the wonders of God at work. And if we keep our vision on the wonders of of God, then we can be caught up in the amazing experience and presence of God and just see where God might be leading us and take us through the door of hope that God has for us. Keep looking for the wonders of God. Thank you. Oh, 
wonderful than my heart can believe he goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams he's everything, he's everything that my that soul ever longed for everything he's promised and so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous, could ever be, he's more than wonderful, that's what Jesus is. Stand amazed when I think that the King of glory would come to live within the heart of man. When I marvel just to know he really loves me, when I think of who he is and who I am. So much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous, could ever be, he's more than wonderful, that's what Jesus the door of hope in our lives so that we can walk through and grow in our wilderness experiences so we become stronger in the Lord and better children of God in this crazy place we call earth well Isaiah as we have said tells us we've got to wait we've got to look we got to hope for the movement of God but our waiting is not doing nothing our waiting is not purposelessness. Our waiting is God-focused. We are waiting on God. We are looking for God. We are hoping for God. And the more we wait on God, look for God, and hope in God, the more God will renew our strength and mount us up with wings like eagles to soar, to run, and not be weary, and to walk, and not be faint. But how do I wait? How do I look for God? How do I hope in God? 
Well, there's a couple of things I want to share with us. First and foremost, we got to realize, number one, that our perspective is not God's perspective. We must align our perspective with God's perspective. Realize God has an eternal view, an honest view, a view of our lives that is not the same view that you and I have. And his view is so much stronger and better. God has a view that will prove a greater vision for our lives than, than we can even dream of. We've got to trust God's view, trust God's perspective, and look for God's perspective. People have often asked me this year, Roger, What's God's plan for the dentist office? And to be honest, I'm not sure what the plan is. All I know is we were going to purchase it, and then all of a sudden we weren't allowed to purchase it. So then the quadplex behind that dentist office on the south east side of the property became available, and we were able to get that property for a good price. And the moment, the week that we signed for that property, the dentist says to us, I'd like to talk to you again about purchasing it. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this timing like this? We, how are we going to afford this now in light of what we've just done fiscally of purchasing the quadplex? Well, we did another in-depth study of it and connected the ministry plan to the quadplex ministry plan. And we saw, we think we could purchase it, but we weren't so sure. So we asked God to show us by raising $40,000 so we could see and make sure God was a part of it. Well, God didn't raise just promises of $40,000. God raised promises of $70,000. Well, then that seems pretty clear as to what God wants us to do. So we were in the midst of negotiating for it, but now all of a sudden there's zoning issues. And we're trying to discern how these zoning issues will impact our ministry plan, if it's a viable way, or if it's not a viable way to purchase the property. And now we're waiting on the city legal department to inform us what we can do or cannot do with the property in its current zoning specification. It's a lot of frustration. It's a lot of waiting. And here's the thing I want to make clear. I hate to wait. I want clarity now. I want to know now. <coughs> Excuse me. But that is not how waiting on the Lord works. It's not about me in my waiting on God. It is about me waiting on God so it becomes about God. You see, waiting, looking, hoping in God is not a punishment I'm going through. Uh, uh, waiting and hoping and looking for God is, is actually a privilege to walk through, to see how God may be acting, to see how God might be realigning my perspective to God's perspective and how God is going to work this all through in the end. That is a privilege. And I have had enough experiences in my life to know God's way is a lot better than my way. It's God's way. It is so beyond my thinking that God often surprises me in ways I haven't even totally anticipated. So one of the things that I have to do during this process of waiting and hoping and looking for God is to sit down, shut up, and anticipate what God might be doing in this process. Sit down, shut up, and look to see what God might be saying, to listen to what God might be saying, and to see what God might be doing. And you know, when you're walking through what you feel like is the valley of the shadow of death, that's really hard to do. But we are called, even when we feel like we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, to sit down, shut up, and look forward to how God might be working things out.
And remember what a friend of mine says, even when we're walking through those difficult experiences, we got to understand God's got our back in these situations. Even in the midst of our own death, God has our back. And if we take a moment to sit down, shut up, and look at what God might be doing or what God might be saying and waiting for God to move, then, maybe then, we can gather God's perspective and see life through God's eyes. God's perspective, not our own human eyes. And God just might unveil a vision in a direction that is literally out of this world to come to fruition and bring somehow into this world the kingdom of God's eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says it this way. It is beautiful how God has done everything at the right time. God has put a sense of eternity in people's minds. Yet people, yet mortals still can't grasp what God is doing from the beginning to the end of time. There is a time and a season for everything. So I've got to take the time to sit down, shut up, listen Look and hope in God so that I might gather God's perspective instead of my own. Secondly, and I know this sounds like a Sunday school answer, a trite spiritual answer. But if we're going to wait upon the Lord, look for the Lord, hope in the Lord, we've got to prioritize prayer in our life. And which means communicating with God and talking with God and thinking about God. And we need to prioritize also our communion, our connection with the saints of God. For if we don't prioritize prayer and don't prioritize communion with each other, we can be locked out of entering the door of hope. You see, we've got to connect with God but also connect with others who have hope in God so they can help unlock that door of hope and help us go through it. That's the purpose of prayer. That's the purpose of the community of God. That's the purpose of your small group, your Sunday school class, your group of friends that gather together in Christ so that these people who have hope, when you don't have it, can give it to you and deliver it to you in, in the community of believers. And if someone approaches you looking for hope, you better give it to them. Because if you don't, you'll become spiritually constipated. You'll become spiritually closed in and uptight and blocked off because you got something someone needs. And I have found out the more you give it, the more you grow. But if you don't, it's spiritual constipation. And sooner or later, you're going to have to let it out or you're going to explode. So, when we hope in the Lord, look for the Lord, trust in the Lord, we're looking to gain God's perspective. And we're also looking to pray to God and commune with God's people so that we can walk through the door of hope. And finally, when we are looking, when we are hoping with God, when we're seeking God out, we've got to trust God, even in the silence. But here's the problem you and I face. You and I are on noise overloading. You go into a restaurant and you got to scream to get above the music because the music's so loud just for people to hear you. And here's the thing in our world. There are a lot of things that are loud, that are blocking what God is trying to tell us, what God is trying to give us in terms of hope. You see, division is loud. Disunity is loud. Hate is loud. And what happens is, is that becomes greater. That noise becomes greater in our lives, and it's hard to hear God in the silence. We have got to take time in the silence and in the walk with God to overcome the noise 
of this world, the noise of division and disunity and hate. And how do we do that? Well, people who are unified in the love of God can overcome that noise. People who are one in God's spirit can overcome that earthly noise. People who put God's love and grace in action towards others can overcome that noise of the world. You see, the noise of the world is criticalness. It's complaint. It's tearing down someone's persona or reputation. But an act of grace towards one another, an act of love upon one another, often helps us see the very presence of God. And that can only happen if we're tuned in to God and trust God and wait on God in silence. You see, when people look upon us and see our unity or love, when people look upon us and see our actions in one spirit, when people see us acting in grace and love with others, then they see the defining force in our lives, the defining characteristic of God in our lives. And that is the purpose of the wilderness. So that when we are struggling the most, we can still be gracious. We can still be loving. We can still help people. You see, we have been in a year where the complaints and the criticisms and the ripping part of people of characters have become our favorite pastime. And it's become the greatest cancer to our society. And yes, even to our Christian faith. Families are fractured over it. Nation, our nation, is divided more than ever over it. And our willingness to beat people up and do character assassination through complaint and criticism is higher than ever. And all the while, while we're in this wilderness, all God wants us to do is to look for him, to hope in him, to see him. And to look for him in such a way that we can discover God deeper and greater and become the people of God, the children of God, that God wants us to be. But the problem is, you and I more often revert to the world around us, rat in the wilderness, rather than to wait to look, to love, to seek out God. And folks, we will never ever walk through the door of hope unless we do that. What I'm saying is it is in our natural fallenness to want to beat people up to destroy rather than to build up. And it is killing our nation. It is killing our relationships. It is killing our families. It is killing our coworkers. And even the very neighbors that God is calling us to love. Take a moment. When you're in the wilderness and you are seeking God out, when you are looking for God, when you are hoping in God, to try to see people from God's eyes. Try to take the people whom you're most frustrated with and see them from the grace and the love of God's eyes. Try for a moment to just sit down, shut up, and silence that critical voice in your head and say, God, help me love them like you love them. God, help me see them like you see them. God, help me be to them what you are to them. And just be silent and wait on God and look for God to energize you to do so. Trust God in the silence. 
You see, God is always guarding you. God is always guarding you and guiding you. And God is always glowing upon you. Isaiah 61 says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news. Good news to the people who are oppressed, who feel like they're walking through the wilderness. Good news to the people who do not have hope. Good news to those who will not walk through the door of hope. And we are called to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and release the prisoners. We don't live through things to become bitter people. We live through things and grow through things so that we can become more like Jesus and mirror Jesus in this world. We are called, yes, to bloom right where we are planted, right in the weed patch, and to keep our eyes on God. You and I are to be that flower, no matter where we are planted, and keep our eyes on God's Son. And then, we can walk through the door of hope and then we can help others go through the door of hope for hope is all that we have and true hope has its eyes set upon God let's pray eternal God Help us be people of hope, even in what seems like a hopeless world. Help us keep our faces set upon you. Lord, when we are feeling hopeless, help us to be in silence, to look into you, to wait upon you, to hope in you. Help us, God, when we are struggling to gather the people of your Help us communicate with you and ultimately help us gather the perspective that only you can give and an eternal perspective right where we are so that we too can walk in the darkest of places and in the greatest of places for your glory and our betterment. In Christ's name we pray. God bless you. May you have a blessed new year in the hope of Jesus. Mm -hmm.